So the title of my talk is Prompting Power of Large Language Models. The first title that I came up with was kind of vague and boring. Then Jakub suggested me, why don't you make it more interesting, add the word prompt to your title? And um, I, I spent like a ton of time, uh, how can I make it this? And then I simply gave the abstract uh, to GPT-3 and then it generated to me this, this prompt, so this title. So <laughs> it kind of, kind of worked, yeah. And, and by the way, this picture is also given this title, you give to the stable diffusion, and then they generate this, this, this robot here. <laughs> anyway, so part one of the talk, we're going to be talking about the things that we can do with large language models. The, then part two will be about the limitations, things that we cannot do yet with these types of models. And then in part three, I'd like to briefly discuss about some futures of these large language models, in particular, uh, if we're ever going to have these uh, avalanche models, so general proposed one trains on diverse data, or if we're going to be specializing then further and further like we do with, uh, let's say, our specialists in our society. But yeah. So part one, things we can do. Uh, before I start, can I have a show of hands? Uh, how many of you here thinks that these models understand what they write. And by understand here, I mean whatever you think the, the word understands mean. Someone here? No? No, just three people? All right. So yeah, so uh, the, my previous NYU lab, Sam Bowen and uh, his folks, they did this meta search survey, asked uh, 300 NLP researchers in the field what they, they think that these large language models understand language. And uh, the answer is uh, uh, could understand, like the, 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 that was the question. And then the answer is like 50% uh, agrees, 50% disagrees. So I guess if you had asked this question uh, two years ago, the answer would be a lot different. Way fewer people would agree with this statement. Um, but anyway, so then we have POM, I guess already saw some examples. It, if you measure 150 uh, tasks, NLP tasks, uh, I guess against the average human performance, uh, the largest model gets on par with it. So that doesn't mean that uh, these models are, are as good as humans, but at least if you see the progress over the years, it's, it's been astonishing. And then you can, I'm pretty sure that most of you saw these examples from Google, the reasoning tasks. Like uh, if you had time later, read these slides, it's uh, super impressive the output the model generates and also can explain jokes. So these jokes were never seen during pre-training, so the guys come up with this, this joke and then the model explain why, it, why it's funny, which makes it uh, lose its, its, its funniness. But anyway, um, what are large language models? I don't think I need to explain much this slide, but uh, you just take a, a text, um, uh, make it into tokens, and then convert those tokens to vectors, feed those vectors to a sequence of vectors, feed those sequence of vectors to these uh, decoder only transformers, which has a lot of parameters, so you use the self-attention to compute another contextualized vector representations for each one of the tokens and the input. And then you take one of these vectors, feed into a linear layer, and um, with a soft max, then you get a probability distribution, and you want the model to, to put a high probability on the token that will complete this sentence. And that's, that's how you do mostly of the state-of-the-art models with ton of parameter, ton of data, ton of compute, right? Uh, so what you can do with them? Like basically, whatever you can feed into these 4,000 tokens, uh, we can do question answering, summarization, name identity recognition, translation, they can write code. And I'll go over the, some details that, uh, that we've been trying ourselves. So we can take, uh, like Marzi just presented the paper in parse. It contains four pages. I just uh, selected everything ex uh, besides the, except the title, abstract, and conclusion, and gave it to the GPT-3 model, the latest version, and with the following prompt, uh, summarize the following text. And then the model generate this summary. In this paper, the Waltz proposed a method for adapting large language models for information retrieval in a cost-effective manner, blah, blah, blah. So we got really nailed down the, the task. And this was just a, a qualitative experiment. And if you want to have numbers, uh, this is a Casper data set. You have a scientific document. You ask a question, and um, human gets 61 F1. Uh, the latest model from OpenAI gets 57. So uh, we're kind of good. If, if the input fits in the model input, uh, the text fits in the model input, we can, we can answer that question quite reliably. Um, and also they have this amazing property that um, uh, they can do few shot, uh, even if they, they weren't trained for the task. And they're now at the level of beating supervised uh, uh, 
machine translation models. So these uh, state-of-the-art machine translation models, they were trained on millions of uh, pairs of examples, some sentences in English, some sound of sentences in French, and then asked to do the translation. And the latest version, Palm, can do more or less the, the same, reach the same level of quality of translation. Uh, but using only five pairs of sentences as input, so no parameter update, and it still can reach SOTA. Um, and then I have a, then you might ask, but but it's saw a ton, maybe even this large pre-training corpus, it saw a, it saw a ton of uh, examples of pairs of uh, English and to French uh, translation. That's how it can it can do this translation. Uh, then I did this experiment. Uh, we take I, I invented this language. This is basic English and um, the same grammar. I just replaced, I do this mapping one-to-one -one from English words to my invented uh, language called Vrarif. And then I asked the model, read the following text in a new language called Vrarif. And then I asked it to translate to, to English. Um, can anyone here guess what, is, what I tried to write here? I know the answer. You know the answer, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's not a poem, by the way. It looks like a poem, but it's not a poem. No, no guesses? All right. So this is, this is what I, I thought. Uh, one, two, three, uh, four, two plus two is four, one plus two is three, et cetera. And the model correctly guessed what I meant here by simply looking at the co-occurrence of these tokens. And uh, it's because you, uh, uber is like two and uber something, uber equals uh, for so it learned by this co-occurrence how to do this translation. It's quite amazing, and that's uh, uh, so. The intuition here, I guess, is uh, you have the sequence of vectors that uh, it, the, the the model actually doesn't see symbol uh, symbols. It's only uh, activations vectors inside. Um, so it saw something similar probably during its pre-training, and that's that's my hunch. What it's doing here, so that's how it can translate. So yeah, amazing, amazing, it's amazing capabilities. And then things that are, I guess, one of the questions in the audience, how we can make these models reason more. And there is this uh, recent line of work in which we induce the model via this few shot prompt to generate explanations before outputting an answer. So this is called step-by-step -step reasoning, your chain of thought prompting. So if you want to, it to solve simple mathematical questions and you give a few examples of a question and then a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, reasoning and then finally outputting the answer. And this improved performance quite a lot. In comparison, if you look, if you use a very large palm with 400 billion, uh, 500 billion parameters, it gets 17% on this uh, hard math data set. And if you use a much smaller model with the chain of thought, you get 33. So you're already uh, inducing the model, the, the feeding the model with the right prompt is equivalent to using a much larger model without the correct prompt. Um, and now I guess this is a very troublesome slide, but at uh, the energy consumption, um, to train Palm is equivalent to flying 150 people from New York to Amsterdam round trip, right? Uh, so they are very inefficient. Uh, people usually say, I just saw this morning a tweet from Pedro Domingo saying, uh, we are in the worst in terms of energy efficiency with uh, these current state of the art uh, AI models. But let's do these calculations. I just showed you that it can summarize uh, scientific articles with four pages quite nicely. So the assumption here is that the output, let's say, is uh, close to average human. Uh, if it's not now, maybe it's going to be in the, in, the, in the short future. So a human takes, let's say, 20 minutes to summarize those uh, four pages. Um, GPT-3 takes about one minute on four eight hundreds. This, uh, I guess it's, it's faster than that, but I just wanted to be generous with humans. Uh, and then assuming that a human consumes 100 uh, power, uh, 100 watts, it will be equivalent to 28 calori kilocalories, or calories in our uh, common jargon. The same if you assume that these 4 800 is going to output to uh, need 2 kilowatts, uh, it's going to consume more or less the same energy, which is equivalent to three gummy bears. So uh, if, uh, if we think much about it, it's, uh, it's not that, that uh, uh, energy inefficient. And I guess in the future, we will have even better models. But then it's not, it's not uh, good things. Like uh, we can do almost anything right with these models. But then I would argue if, y if you the necessary information, uh, the, uh, to accomplish a task uh, fits in its input. So if you have, for example, information that is dispersed over a lot of documents, uh, you cannot do this task. So try asking this question, what are the promising techniques in NLP? 
uh, you're probably going to have to cover a bunch of papers until you reach a conclusion. And that you cannot, it, there is no easy way to solve, uh, to answer this question with the current techniques. Um, and for that, we need the search engine. We need to retrieve documents. Um, there is this data set in which you, you feed, uh, there is a question, and there's exactly this case, the information dispersed over uh, Wikipedia, and you have to collect all of it until you, you reach the answer. Humans get 88. If you feed GPT-3 with this oracle evidence, meaning that uh, you give uh, three or four paragraphs over the entire Wikipedia that are sufficient and necessary to answer the question, then you get a pretty close to the, to the, the performance achieved by humans. So this is more or less the picture. Like the question in three simple uh, contexts and then uh, ask the model to provide an answer. But then this is kind of cheating. You already know the, the, the right context. If you leave to a search engine to retrieve what, are the, what the search engine thinks are relevant evidence, then performance drops to 50%. So I will argue here that the bottlenecks are the search engines. Uh, we, we current models, if you provide the correct information, you can pretty much solve uh, this task. But then with a search engine, it causes a lot of trouble. And also another limitation from these models is that um, um, I just struck with Andrew this, uh, this morning uh, at lunch. Uh, this, it outputs all these nonsensical questions. If you ask when Madonna became the president of the Netherlands, it outputs an answer, but probably it's because it saw the impression. It's, it's all a completion to this type of answer, this type of question. And probably can fix this by providing the model the correct prompt, like inducing it to reach a conclusion that there is no such thing as Madonna being the president of the Netherlands. But then goes back to the problem with the search engine. How do you find this relevant information um, the, uh, on the fly reliably? And the same uh, with another example, why do we laugh when we drink milk? The model is trained, whatever the reason, there is no doubt that milk can be a source of laughter for many people. And that's how it answers. Um, another limitation, this one is a, is a really puzzle. I thought that it could solve quite easily. But uh, if you try this test to identify repeated rows in a table, um, and you give one example, as, as one shot example, uh, it completely fails. Like uh, even though I tried a bunch of different the item numbers, combination locals, it, it cannot solve this. So it's quite puzzling. It, it can do summarize the scientific paper. It can really narrows down what is the main thing that we're talking about, but it cannot solve this simple task. So to me, still no right clear answer yet. Another limitation that uh, we explore uh, with some students is that uh, they have really a hard time counting and tracking exact position of tokens in its input. So there is this data set called SCAM, uh, the length split. So the input is an instruction run around left thrice, and then the model needs to output left run, left run, left run, uh, 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 12 times. And then the model here, uh, we fine tune GPT-3, the largest version, on thousands of these examples, it still cannot get the right answer. Uh, but then we induce the model to give an explanation first. So it's, it's, it's first says run around left corresponds to four left run commands because of the word thrice, run around left thrice results in three times four and blah, blah, blah. And then it was able to give the right answer. But we had to add this small trick here, this what we call in yellow, the markup tokens, which helps the model to count how many tokens output so far. And this is, I'm talking about only 12. Like uh, we could easily, uh, keep track of that, uh, we as humans, but the model cannot. So we have always these extra tricks there to make it work on these very long sequences. And by doing this, uh, well, before we couldn't like reach a good uh, accuracy in, on this data set, the best model so far was around 20%. By introducing these markup tokens, we're able to get to 95%. So it it's, was really important to, to have this precise information. But I think among the, all the limitations of these large language models is the cost. Like if you're working with NLP and you have a single document, uh, a single page document, fitted to GPT-3, uh, 175 billion parameters, it's gonna cost you, if you use the OpenAI API, it's gonna cost you one cent of a dollar per document, which is not much, or 10 seconds on 4800s if you have the hardware. But then let's say you want to work on retrieval tasks. Let ask GPT-3 to re-rank the documents for me. Like I just uh, uh, retrieve 100 documents using BM25, given a query, and then we ask the, the GPT-3 to reorder them for me. This is gonna cost me $1 per query or 15 minutes on uh, four 800s. And uh, things get even worse if you use dense retrieval. Let's say I want to convert each one of the passages on the MS Marco dataset to a single vector. Um, 
It's gonna cost you $400,000 using the OpenAI API or four months on 4800. So it's a pretty bad idea to, to use these models, these large collections, and that's why I argue costs so far, it's, it's one of the biggest concerns. Um, and to, to, uh, as a final thought, I would like to discuss about the future of the, what these large language models, what do we expect from them? Uh, and one question that I'm really interested in, in uh, trying to answer is if uh, we ever get uh, these domain-specific pre-training will be a thing. Uh, because up until now, it seems that a training models on uh, diverse and large uh, training data sets is a good idea, making them specialized, not so much. But uh, I think we never showed us recently that uh, that's not the case. Uh, you can train on more text with math. Uh, this is Minerva, it's just Palm with more, uh, more pre-trained on text and then can answer more complicated questions. For example, this one, a particle moves at uh, following this equation at time t, find the speed of the particle and then the output of the model using this uh, uh, reasoning step is that the speed is the magnitude of the vector, uh, velocity vector and blah 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 and so on and derive all the equations for us. So it's pretty impressive um, and I think more interesting is uh, the ratio between the number of parameters and the accuracy that you can get with the specialized models. So in mass specific data set, uh, Minerva with 8 billion parameters can do better than Palm with 500 billion parameters. So it seems that uh, it's a good idea to, to always specialize your models, but it's still not clear if that's going to be a trend. And uh, we've ourselves been doing these experiments. Uh, we're trying, we're pre-training uh, the 6 billion parameter version of uh, GPT-J. Um, it was originally trained on uh, English-centric pre-training and then we wanted to evaluate in Portuguese uh, tasks and then we collected this Portuguese pre-training data and we're fine-tuning. Of course, the model is now much better than the original DPTJ with 6 billion parameters but uh, that model didn't see that much Portuguese before so it's, it's kind of obvious that uh, uh, we didn't expect that much of an improvement to be honest. But now we're approaching the level of the 175 billion uh, from Da Vinci in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, a question answering task in Portuguese. So it seems also for uh, if you want to specialize your model in the particular language is also a good idea, you're going to save a ton of parameters. Of course, you have the, the trade-off of having to pre-train these models. And another good thing about these pre-trains is if you, uh, we are using now a language-specific tokenizer, so now we can feed 50% more bytes or, or words as input to our model for the same amount of compute. And uh, I guess the same should apply to domain-specific data if you have scientific documents or medical or whatever. But then there is a counter argument for, for, this, for this prediction here. It, uh, the Facebook Meta uh, won, I believe, the last year's WMT competition. And for the first time, they, use, uh, they won by using a multilingual model uh, instead of a bilingual one. So it seems that uh, as soon as you reach a certain number of parameters, a multilingual can beat a monolingual or even a, a, a bilingual one. So that's some uh, recent evidence that uh, we just got. And so, yeah, to conclude my talk, these current uh, large language models can do almost anything uh, if the necessary information fits its input. Uh, but I think finding the relevant information is still a bottleneck. There, we're always going to be constrained by, uh, let's say, a cheap search engine that cannot dedicate that much compute to investigate an uh, entire corpus. Um, so uh, I would argue that investing in better search mechanism, it's, it's a good idea. Uh, this step-by-step -step reasoning uh, is very promising. You, you can have better answers and also a, a little bit of interpretability It's added uh, because now you can expect what part of the, your question the model didn't understand well. These models they still make a lot of mistakes, but the progress is, is a lot of fast. I expect in the near future to have even better uh, models. And in the future, uh, if you are a user of these large language models, I think cost is what matters. Uh, we're doing these calculations to compute all these um, analysis for what is the GPU usage among papers that use a uh, transformer for speech, something like that. Uh, if you compare against a human laborly extracting that data, uh, a model is way more cost effective. But as for a researcher, uh, I'm really interested if uh, the specialized models will have a chance in the future or are you just going to have to use this very large one, general purpose. Yeah. And then the thanks for, for my co-authors. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have questions in the audience.
Hi, uh, thanks a lot. So I was really confused by the example with the, f the non-existent language translation by the model. So I don't completely understand what happened there, actually. Have you looked at uh, how the example was tokenized? Maybe there is some leak to some words that exist in some language that means something that could lead to this translation? Like, I don't completely understand it. Like, do you understand? Well, what I don't there? understand either. <laughs> like, uh, uh, so the intuition... It's crazy. It's... it's uh, I also don't understand fully. Uh, the which model is that actually? It's uh, Da Vinci 002. Ah, this is the yeah. So yeah. So have you looked at the tokenization, like what what uh, the tokens um, look so like? If you use a lot of uh, notice that I use yeah, three character sure. words. Yeah. If I use okay. a lot of characters, it doesn't work. Yeah. Sure. No. I see. Yeah. It, okay. Yeah. I guess like I mean, if there is no good, I just wanted to say how cool was that. <laughs> like how weird yeah, is that? Yeah. yeah. I mean. and, and then there is also like there are some uh, case sensitive patterns. Like Mayola is. Is married. it a case sensitive model? I don't remember. It, it's because I think the first letter it's capitalized. It knows that it has a, a, a proper noun. Uh, yeah, but I mean the tokenizer is it? Yeah. Th yeah. yeah. But yeah, we also sure. don't fully understand that. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for a great talk. I had a question about the prompting because uh, it almost seems like you're actually already solving the task. What do you think about that? Uh, okay. Can you say it again, sorry? Yeah, it almost seems like it, you're already almost solving the complete task by, you know, you're doing the computation, um, but not exactly saying what the answer is. Or, or how does that work? I, I don't do a lot of prompting, so. Uh, you mean for, for each task, for any of these tests that I showed? Yeah, so there were a couple of examples. I think one of them is, uh, I've, I also know them, I think I've seen them before with the apples, for example. Ah. Um, and then the example ends basically with, uh, so. Like this. Um, yeah, which one was this? So. Yeah, this is the. Yeah, exactly. Six 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 for example, yeah. the right side one. So they have three plus six is equals nine, and then the model answers. The answer is nine, right? Right. But in the 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 kind of input on the right side that we add, which makes the model perform a lot better, um, is it easy to 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 retrieve to kind of generate this input, or is it is that not already a complex task? Uh, so so the input here to the model is the question. Uh, the input is in, in blue, uh, the question plus some, that blue, it's an explanation generated by a human for that particular question. And then the output is an explanation generated by the model. So the model understood that it needs to, be, to generate an explanation first. So it, it kind of be solving the, the full task uh, without, uh, the only extra knowledge it has is an explanation from the previous example. Yeah. Anyone else? Thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned a few times that we are also interested when the input can fit in the actual model. Do you see research also uh, keeping up to date with this regard, how we can make it more efficient to encode more uh, tokens at the input? Uh, I, I think that's, that's why you're always going to need a search engine, because if you're reading a book, it's, it seems very hard that you can uh, process that book at inference time uh, using an expensive model. That's why I think that narrowing down, uh, using a cheaper model to select what are the relevant parts that you're going to need, uh, it's key to, to, to expand to longer context. Yeah. No one else? I can go last. Um, I wanted to ask about your opinion or like if you're hopeful that, so all of these models are uh, to regressive, right? Like completely left to right. Um, but sometimes it would be nice, right, to get context from before and after, right, the prompt. So I, n I know that the, the GPT, uh, like OpenAI provides an API for kind of like filling in blanks type of uh, generation. Like, are you hopeful that that's going to become part of this toolbox or you think left to right is kind of good enough? Um, uh, so there is a recent paper from, uh, I guess, Alexa team from, from Amazon. They published a 20 billion parameter model that used the full sequence to sequence model, like T5 style. And um, it, it does this bidirectional with the encoder part and uh, auto regressive with the decoder part. And um, they showed that it's much better than doing decoder only. That's why I think in the future we might see more of these than the current ones that we have. But it's still also not clear why, why that's the best model. Yeah, I just found it a bit weird that it's, like intuitively I thought it, it uh, would get, um, would make things much better, but then a lot of these people just train it left to right and maybe just simpler to. Uh, 